Lux presents Hollywood. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Flakes, bring you the Lux Radio Theater, starring Paulette Goddard and Patrick Knowles in Kitty. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. London in the 1700s was a city of sharp contrasts, of beggarly squalor and pretentious luxury. Swung between these two extremes is the story of Kitty, an illiterate cockney waif who is lifted out of the Houndsditch slums to become the toast of England, partly because a great artist saw beneath her dirt and rags a haunting beauty. Starred in our title role, as she was in Paramount's screenplay, is Paulette Goddard, one of Hollywood's most talented and lovely actresses. Co-starred with Patrick Knowles, who tonight makes his debut in our theater. The screen production, Kitty, was a costume maker's dream, laid in a period when ladies of quality dressed to the hilt in gorgeous gowns and numberless fluffy petticoats and fashion decreed that they be kept fresh and new-looking to save the beauty of those costly fabrics. Just how this was accomplished in a period when no such thing as Lux Flakes was available, I don't know. But I do know that the studio kept those costumes fresh and spotless through long weeks of shooting by daily Lux Care, something I'm sure you women in the audience appreciate and practice in your own homes. It's time for our curtain and Act One of Kitty, starring Paulette Goddard in the title role and Patrick Knowles as Sir Hugh Mossy. <music> London, 1783. In front of his fashionable residence, Thomas Gainsborough, the celebrated painter, has just caught a thief, a miserable and ragged young woman who struggles vainly to escape. I let go when the constable arrives, picking my pocket in front of my own house. Now, please, Your Honor, I only did it because I was hungry. I got a sister who was sick. All I wanted was a little soup for her, that's all. Me and her's all alone in the world. Filthy little gutter snipe. How much did you expect to get for my snuff box? Half a crown. Cost me five times that. If you wanted a female, I'd... Wait a minute. Beneath that dirt, you possess a face, don't you? Hmm. Quite a remarkable face, too, Begad. So you want money, do you? Get in the house. Yeah, what you think you're doing? I have a way for you to earn half a crown. Go down to the end of the hall there. What for? You'll find soap and water in there. Use it. And remove that filthy rag you're wearing. I'll get you something else to put on. Why should I? And mind you, wash thoroughly, particularly your hair. Oh. One more sound out of you and I'll fetch a constable this instant. Into that room. I'm going, Governor. I'm going. <laughs> What's the idea dressing me up so fancy-like? Keep quiet and sit down. I'm about to paint your portrait. What's your name? Kitty. Your full name? I ain't got no fuller name. I see. Well, my name's Gainsborough. Now, let me have your profile. Have me what? Your... Oh, just look that way. No, 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 no. Toward the light. Why? Because I... Say so. Young woman, you're beautiful. I knows it. Oh, you do? <laughs> you ain't the only bloke I ever met, you know. Kitty, but for the accident of birth, you might have been the reigning... Hold still, will you? The reigning beauty of the land. All England at your feet. My feet? What for? Unfortunately, however, you are cursed with articulation. Eh? You can talk. Blimey, so can you. I don't like it, neither. But they'll never hear you speak. A painting cannot talk. I think I shall call this the portrait of an anonymous lady. <laughs> it shall be quite a lark, Kitty. London will rack its brains, wondering who my exquisite and highborn model is. <laughs> hey, one moment, one moment. Now what? Nothing, nothing. Just sit there and keep quiet. Put away your brushes, Tom. I need some money. <laughs> money again? Brett Carstairs is off for India. Yes, I know. I'd like to go with him, except I, uh, I don't have the fare. Oh, what a pity. If you'd advance it, Tom, you'd be rid of me. Just think what... <clears throat> Well, well now, Tom, be civil, man, be civil. Introduce me to the lady. 
The lady doesn't care to meet anyone. I'll ask her. You'll do no such thing. The lady is not here for social reasons. What a shame. Hugh, I'm very busy. Oh, of course. Sorry. See you on, old genius. Now can I talk? If you must. Who was he? Friend of mine. So you, Marcy. Can't understand how I got rid of him so easily. He said he wanted to meet me. Of course he wanted to meet you. Beautiful girl, beautifully attired. But what if you'd opened your mouth? What's the matter with me mouth? I talk English, don't I? I have a good mind to just... Do you want to earn half a crown, or don't you? Yes, Governor. Then be silent. You will come here every day at the same hour until the portrait's finished. Half a crown every day, my girl. But you're to leave here every day in the same rags you came in. You understand? This is my little game, and those are my little rules. Now, let's get to work. Forgive me, milady. What? Oh, it's you. Ingenious. Positively ingenious. But who are you, please, and why masquerade in tatters? See here, you... You were sitting for Mr. Gainsborough, were you not? Sitting for half a crown, I was. Numb to the bone, too. Rummy, taint half turned cold at times. Oh, 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 that cockney. Incredible. Oh, no, no. What you laughing not at? Not at you, my girl, at myself. In the studio, you were a beautiful and silent lady. Wealthy, no doubt, too. Now? Well? Now I discover I've been waiting two hours to meet, well, to meet what I see before my eyes. Do you realize I had hopes of driving you home in my carriage? Come off it. Get in the carriage. I'll still drive you home. Oh. Where do you live? Houndsditch. Houndsditch, coachman. Houndsditch. Very good, sir. Now watch your game, you. One look at your rags and any game I had in mind is definitely off. You uh, live with your family? Oh, with me father. Close on to 80, poor old dear. Blind as a bat he is. Me and him's all alone in the world. Sad, isn't it? I has to take care of him. I... Oh, it's gone! It's gone in here! What? Me off crown! It's gone! You misplaced some money? Oh, the off crown the painter gave me! It's gone! Sit still. There have been many worse tragedies. Oh, but I got to have it. Old Meg will knock me blinking head off. Old Meg? Who's she? Oh, You it... can tell me. You see, I didn't believe a word about a blind old father. So you live with someone named Old Meg, eh? Bonded to her, I am. All the girls is bonded to her. She'll tear the eye off me for coming home with me hands empty. Then you better not go home. Sleep in the street and catch my death. Not a very alluring prospect, is it? Too true it ain't. Well, if you care to help in the scullery, you can come home to my house. At least you'll have a place to sleep and no one to beat you. Do you mean stay there? For a while, yes. And I can still go to the painter every day for half a crown? If you wish. Gory. I ain't never met no one like you before. You're a proper gent, you are. Well, thank you. I was sure you'd know the real thing. We've changed our minds, coachman. You may drive us straight home. So you're Kitty, eh? Well, I'm Dobson, Mr. Dobson, steward of this here house. So you says I'm to work in the scullery. So he told me. Also, he says you ought to have something to eat. Sit down. Sausage and tea. That's not good enough. Well, I'll eat it. But ain't this a toff's house? It's a toff's house, all right, and a toff lives in it. Sir Hugh, ha. finest manners in London, best clothes and the most creditors. Him? Yes, him. He used to be with a foreign office, he did, with the government. Had a bit of money coming in. Then he got mixed up in a scandal. Some say it was a lady. Some say a string of pearls that wasn't his. But between you and me, knowing him like I do, I'd say it was a little of each. What happened? Got himself thrown out, he did. And since then, he's been one step ahead of debtor's prison. It's my guess he'll be in jail inside the week. Prison's a good place for him, too. Here, you stop talking about him that way. What's that? Don't you say nothing against him. He's a fine gent. He has took me in off the streets he did just out of a kind heart, well, didn't he? <laughs> he never did want for a female to speak up for him. Here now, take some tea up to her ladyship. What ladyship? His aunt, that's what. Lady Susan. Oh, his aunt. I'll find her. I can always answer that, my girl. You'll find her indisposed as usual. Careful now, don't spill it. This is the girl I was telling you about, Aunt Susan. Kitty, this is my aunt, Lady Susan Dowd. How? Oh. Put that tray down. It's your tea, Mum. Tea? Oh, surely you the must Sorry, be... darling, not a drop in the house. Come here, girl. Well, your face looks clean, but 
You'll have to burn that horrible rag you're wearing. I'm very careful about appearances. I know I'm not at my best today, but I've been ill. I've had a, a chill. Beg your pardon, Sir Hugh. What is it, Dobson? There's another one just come. Another what? Another creditor, sir, the tailor. I have five tailors. Mr. McNabb, sir, been here three times today. Oh, well, if a man wants to see you that badly. Excuse me, Aunt Susan. Humiliated by tradesmen, insulted by merchants. Well, make the tea, girl. Don't know as I know how. Well, then, do you know how to pull a cork out of a bottle? Oh, yes, am Look under the pillow. Last bottle in the house. Oh, what's to happen to me? What's to happen to me? It wasn't always like this. I can assure you, it wasn't always like this. All alone, Tom? I thought Kitty was posing for you today. No, no, no. She, she left an hour ago. I, um... I'm surprised to see you. Oh, why? I was in the neighborhood. I, I heard ugly rumors this morning, Hugh. Debtor's prison. Forget it. But I... I said forget it. Debtor's prison, indeed. Well, how's the portrait going? Let me look at it. No, not now. Perhaps, perhaps on Saturday at the exhibition. Exhibition? You mean you finished it? It's finished. Just wait until they see, Kitty. Just wait until they see our anonymous lady. Saturday, you said? Two o'clock in Granby Hall. I'll be there. As good a place as any to escape the sheriff. You, for heaven's sake, when are you going to do something about yourself? Who knows, Tom? Maybe Saturday afternoon at Granby Hall. I haven't had such sport in years, you. They're all guessing. Who is the anonymous lady? What is her name? You've told no one? Tell the elites of London that I've painted a dirty, ragged street cabin. You forget. Kitty's become our scullery maid, but don't ask me why. She's hopeless. Oh, ho, ho, ho. you can look at that portrait and say she's hopeless? No. I say what they all say. She's breathtaking, Tom, the most dazzling creature in London. Gainsborough! Oh, oh, uh, yes, yes, Your Grace. The portrait... Who is she? The anonymous lady, Your Grace. Oh, uh, you know Sir Hugh Marcy, do you not? Uh, sir, here. The Duke of Marlmonster and I have met before, Mr. Gainsborough. We have, no doubt, no doubt. Gainsborough, she's gorgeous, simply gorgeous. Odds, heart, look at the crowd gawking at her. The painting's not being purchased. Uh, not yet, Your Grace. Then I'll buy it. The price is 150 guineas. Did I ask the price? She's exquisite. Now, who is she? Who? The anonymous lady. I've purchased the picture, Mr. Gainsborough. I demand to know who the lady is. And I deeply regret, Your Grace, I cannot tell you. If you care to step in the ante room, my lord, perhaps I can tell you. Hugh! Oh, don't leave us, Tom. Yes, my lord, while Mr. Gainsborough has promised not to reveal the lady's identity, I have not. She's a Miss Kitty Gordon. Well, what about her? Who is she, sir? She's the ward of my aunt. Her father was Squire Alfred Gordon of, of Devon. Killed some years ago in a hunting accident. Her mother died soon after, a broken heart. Tragic, tragic. Since the poor girl had no one else, my aunt took her in. Odds life. I should like very much to meet Miss Gordon, sir. Your Grace, I think... Unfortunately, I, I think at the moment, Miss Gordon is traveling abroad. But she's uh, as beautiful as he's uh, painted her. <laughs> as young, as fresh. More beautiful, Your Grace. <laughs> Your pardon, Mr. Gainsborough, but no oil can capture the vivacity, the charm, the eagerness for life in this young creature. Indeed, I must meet her the instant she returns. Uh, uh, what did he say your name is, sir? Sir Hugh Marcy. Marcy, Marcy, sounds very familiar. Well, next time I shall know you for certain. Send the portrait to my home immediately. Your servant, sir. You, will you kindly tell me what you're up to? Revenge. What? Revenge. That old buzzard had me thrown out of the foreign office. I think London might heartily enjoy the knowledge if the Duke of Marlmonster became involved with a little gutter snipe from Houndsditch. And I'll wager my life he'll... Shh, careful, careful. I've finally placed you, Marcy. My lord? Foreign office, aren't you? I was, Your Grace. I believe your nephew now holds my post. Uh, there's a possibility I made a mistake. Uh, Marcy, I'm not a man to forget a favor. Bear in mind I'm most anxious to meet Miss Gordon. I'll attend to it, Your Grace. Oh, thank you, my boy. Thank you. Forget what I said about revenge, Tom. This looks like the beginning of a new career. You'll never get by with it. He'll have you thrown out of the foreign office all over again as soon as he finds out who the girl really is. I don't intend he'll ever find out. By the moment she opens her mouth, you, you can't possibly palm her off as a lady. You forget that she's traveling, Tom, and travel is very educational. Oh, oh you're 
going to teach her manners. A hopeless task, is it? Well, I'm used to hopeless situations. As a matter of fact, I'm sick to death of them. Give me a few weeks' time, Tom, and not even you will recognize your anonymous lady. All right, Kitty, we'll try it once again. Now try, please try to imagine that you're a lady. You're paying a call on a friend. She offers you tea. Yes, sir. Miss Gordon, do you take milk and sugar in your tea? I takes what I get an appetite, I am. Oh, you, it's no use. It's no use. Give the girl a chance, Susan. If you were training a dog, you wouldn't expect results immediately. A dog wouldn't be mouthing that horrible cockney. Susan! Oh, very well. Pray drink your tea, Miss Gordon. I'm doing my best. No, Kitty, no. Tea is imbibed from the cup, not from the saucer. The cup is held in one hand like, like this. Thumb and forefinger thusly. All right, try it again. Yes, sir, you. Susan, I said we'd try it again. Oh, very well. Pray drink your tea, Miss Gordon. Five weeks of this, Hugh. Five weeks. I'm going crazy. And where do you think I'm going? I'm not a lady and I don't want to be one. Stop it, both of you. Stop it. Uh, we'll, we'll start again. All right, Kitty. Milk and sugar, Lady Susan? Milk and sugar, Lady Susan? Just milk, my dear. Thank you. So sorry to hear about the tragic death of your father. Good, Kitty, good. My dear mother died shortly afterwards of a broken heart. No, 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 not heart! Your mother died of a broken heart. Remember your H's. Now say that. Remember your H's. No, no. Oh, no. What did your mother die of? My mother died shortly afterwards of a broken heart. And then I came to live with my dear auntie. Once again. Milk and sugar, Lady Susan. Just sugar, my dear. Huh? Well, give her sugar. People don't all take it alike. That's what you ask them for. But she said milk before. This is a different tea. She's a different person. She wants sugar and never, never under any circumstances say A again. Now, once more. Milk? Sugar, Lady Susan? Both. Ah! Once more. I can't do it. I can't do it. How do I look? Tell me, how do I look? You're beautiful, Kitty. Beautiful. I never saw such a dress. Not even the one Mr. Gainsborough let me wear. Yes, the dressmaker has done wonders, Hugh. But what miracle have you in mind by way of paying the dressmaker? The necklace Uncle Ralph brought you from Brussels. Never. That's one thing I shall not give up. You have given it up, Susan. You? Oh, no, no, You'll no. get it back, believe me, with interest. Now, what have you two been doing all day? The alphabet. Oh, forget the alphabet. A beautiful girl has no need for a pen. She should at least be able to sign her own name. Yes, at least. What I see now pleases me. Our little gutter snipe looks like a lady. Well, we'll rehearse a bit. Miss Gordon, may I present the Duke of Malmunster? Good afternoon, uh, Your Grace. Fine, Kitty, fine. The Duke was just saying we're having an early spring this year. Indeed we are. The daffodils are blooming early. Blooming! Blooming! <laughs> Can't you learn to say a simple sound like a G? Oh, for heaven's oh, sake. Oh, blooming will go boil your head. I'm sick of it, dear. I can't do nothing to satisfy you. Kitty! You're working her too hard, you. We'll do it once more, Kitty. If you do it correctly this time, there'll be no more lessons till tomorrow. Now, go over to the doorway and walk out here to the terrace. You're too hard, Hugh. I'm not. Are you ready? I'm ready. So nice to see you again, Miss Gordon. Thank you, Sir Hugh. May I present the Duke of Malmunster? Good afternoon, Your Grace. The Duke was just saying that we're having an early spring this year. Indeed we are. The daffodils. Oh, now what? I told you, you're too impatient. Am I? You're the one who didn't have any faith in this experiment. What's changed you? She's changed me, Kitty. But you can't wear the child out. For heaven's sake, Kitty, stop crying. What do you want me to do? Anything, nothing. Sir Hugh, Mr. Selby is calling, sir. Selby? The gentleman who lives next door, sir. Oh, the ironmonger. Tell him we're not home, Dobson. Uh, very good, sir. I think we should see Mr. Selby. 
Oh, why? She might as well begin meeting people. It'll be good experience. But Selby's in trade. He sells iron. He's not even a gentleman. And Kitty's not a lady. Not yet. Yes, you're right. Now, sit down, Kitty. Mind your tongue. If you don't know what to say to Mr. Selby, well, just smile. I'll try. Dobson! Uh, yes, Sir Hugh. Tell Mr. Selby we'll be very happy to see him. <laughs> These for you, Lady Susan, from my own garden. How very kind of you. Oh, my ward, Mr. Selby, Miss Gordon. Uh, your most obedient servant, Miss Gordon. Mr. Selby, the uh, daffodils are blooming early. Indeed, Miss Gordon. But their bloom is not to be compared to the bloom on your cheeks. Come, Selby. Miss Gordon is very young, and I feel it my duty to warn her against such eloquence. Oh, I'd like nothing better than to turn Miss Gordon's head, sir, if it were turned in my direction. Your wit is sharp, Selby. Did you ever think of taking up playwriting? Well, now, I did write an ode once. I knew it. Such felicity of phrase can hardly be accidental. Uh, Miss Gordon, if you care to read my ode, I'd be glad to bring it over at some future time. Ode? Why not tomorrow, Mr. Selby? And take tea with us. Oh, you do me great honor, Mum. Uh, well, uh, well, I really must go now. It's been ever so nice meeting you, Miss Gordon. Mm -hmm. oh, that wondrous smile. Mm -hmm. Your servant, Lady Susan. Uh, see you. Mr. Selby. Uh, till tomorrow, then. Oh, what an idiot. But a rich idiot. Kitty, my dear, he never once took his eyes off you. Fascinated like a rabbit. <laughs> oh, no, you don't, Susan. I won't have it. It would solve our financial difficulties. We'd ask for a large dower before we'd let Kitty marry him. Marry? You know, who's marrying you? Be quiet. I'm saving Kitty for the Duke of Marlmunster. You know what that means to me. Do you mean to say you've been teaching me all these things so I can marry somebody? Not somebody. You've been fortunate enough to have been greatly admired by the Duke of Marlmunster. I don't want him. I mean, him. No one's asking what you want. The Duke's a widower, one of the foremost peers in the realm. You should be honored. Well, I ain't. And you can tell him to off it. He can blink and well off it. I don't want to be no duchess. I ain't marrying him or anybody else, I ain't. Extraordinary. I never expected Kitty to refuse a duke. Well, don't worry about it. You heard what she said. And what would you do if you had to choose between the duke and going back to Houndsditch? Ah, Yes. She's told me about Houndsditch and that frightful creature she's bonded to, old Meg. Well? I'd take the Duke, of course. But then I'm a lady. I have an idea our little gutter snipe is above that sort of thing. Bah. Kitty, there's no sense locking yourself in your room any longer. I told you this afternoon, nobody can make me marry nobody. No one's going to make you do anything. Kitty, Hugh's gone. They've taken him away. Taken him? Who took him? His creditors, just now, hmm. to debtor's prison. But why'd you let them do it? You've got to get him out. With what? It takes money. Can't you borrow none or steal none? He can't stay there. It'll kill him at will. Oh, we're finished, Kitty. I don't know what will become of me. I suppose I'll end up in Houndsditch with you. I'll never go back to Houndsditch. Then let's try Cheapside. Lady Susan. What is it? Mr. Selby is downstairs, my lady, with more flowers. Tell Mr. Selby to go back to his forge and beat his head on his anvil. I'm going to lie down. Yes, my lady. Wait. You said Mr. Selby has money. How much will he pay for me? Pay? What do you mean? You said he'd pay to marry me. Oh, the dower. Yes. Hugh was furious when I suggested it. He wasn't in prison then. Dobson, tell Mr. Selby that Lady Susan is ill, but that Miss Gordon will be down. You're going to entertain him by yourself? I ain't going to entertain nobody. I'm going to marry him. <laughs> In a moment, we'll return with Act Two of Kitty, starring Paulette Goddard and Patrick Knowles. Say, Libby, what's this story going the rounds about Jimmy Stewart? Oh, I heard it from Jimmy himself. About a week before Frank Capper was due to start shooting his first Liberty Films production, It's a Wonderful Life, it suddenly came over Jimmy. How was he going to do? This was his first picture in five years. 
He began boning up on the first scene like a schoolboy the night before exams. He could recite that scene in his sleep. Well, the first day on the set, Capper strolled over and said he'd made a slight change in plans and would do a different scene first. Well, Jimmy's heart sank as he thumbed through the script. Donna Reed started the scene. She said, are you going towards home? No, Jimmy replied. And that was it. He made his first speech without a fumble. <laughs> well, uh, how did he get on after that? Oh, splendidly, of course. Although he insists he's just not naturally the graceful type, he and Donna Reed do a wonderful Charleston number in It's a Wonderful Life. It's a dance contest. And a pretty strenuous dance, I imagine. And quite a strain on stockings, too. The 150 extras who take part in that scene naturally worried about stocking runs. They were advised to lux their stockings at the end of every day's shooting. Hollywood studios say that luxing cuts down runs amazingly. And they're so right, Libby. A scientific laboratory proved that, remember? They made strain tests on a number of stockings, many different kinds. The stockings that were washed with a strong soap soon broke down under strain. But identical stockings washed with Lux flakes lasted twice as long. And knowing how to make stockings last longer with Lux is mighty important to any size budget. You know, an interesting thing about those tests is that all kinds of Lux stockings showed similar results. Silk, nylon, rayon, cotton, too. And getting twice the wear from a pair of stockings is just like getting an extra pair every time you buy a pair. A thrifty tip for every girl, Libby. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. You're listening to Same Time, Same Station, the best of old-time radio. And I'm your host, Jerry Hendigas. We continue with Act Two of Kitty, starring Paulette Goddard in the title role and Patrick Knowles as Sir Hugh Marcy. It required only ten days for Kitty to make herself the bride of the smitten Mr. Selby. And during those days, Sir Hugh Marcy has languished in debtor's prison. But the day after the wedding, Hugh suddenly discovers he's a free man again. Well, how did you do it, Kitty? Where'd you get the money? You stole it. Or Mr. Gainsborough, perhaps. Your debts were paid out of the dower Mr. Selby paid to Lady Susan. Dower? I married Mr. Selby yesterday. You did what? Throw yourself away on that stupid, bloated oaf? I didn't care about anything but getting you out of prison. Didn't it occur to you that this wrecks my plans for you and the Duke? Ends any chance I'll ever have of getting back into the foreign office. I didn't do it because I wanted to. Tying no holiday being married to him a day. I only wanted to help you. Help me? All right, it's done. No use weeping over it. Stop here, coachman. Where are you going? My dear girl, I didn't marry Jonathan Selby. I have to make a living somehow. Fortunately, here's White's gambling house. If I win, I'll buy you a wedding present, Mrs. Selby. Marcy. It is you, isn't it, Marcy? Good day, Your Grace. Where have you been? When we last met, you were going to arrange a meeting with Miss Gordon. Yes, I remember. She's returned from her travels? Yes. Well, <laughs> when am I going to meet her? The sooner the better, you know. I doubt if you'd want to meet her now, Your Grace. Uh, she was just married. Married? Odds blood. How did that happen? Oh, one of those cases of love at first sight, I suppose. Why did you allow it? You knew I was interested in her. I'm more sorry than you know, my lord. Marcy, what I asked you to do required tact and diplomacy. The same qualities demanded in His Majesty's service. You have demonstrated a conspicuous lack of both. It would be my great fortune, sir, never to see you again. You sent for me, Mrs. Selby? Come in, Mrs. Nullins. I know you've been a Mr. Selby's housekeeper for a number of years, but this is something I won't stand for. Beating the scullery maid. Please, Mrs. Selby, she, she didn't hurt me. It's all right, Nellie. She's a shiftless little good-for-nothing man. Maybe she is. But hit her again and I'll knock your blinking head off. What? 
I, uh, I do not wish to discuss it further. Yes, ma'am. Lady Susan is waiting for you in the drawing room. <laughs> oh, thank you, ma'am. Stop your sniveling, Nelly. You dear sweet lady, taking me in and giving me an O. You've got a good art, you have. I've got a good memory. Now get back to your work. I've got to see Lady Susan. And I wouldn't think of bothering you, Kitty, except that we're in desperate trouble. And you're the only one who can help us. What's happened? You? His gambling debts. He may have to go back to prison. How much, Lady Susan? Sixty pounds. Love a duck! <gasps> Kitty, your language, dear. But what about the dower money? Surely it's it not It went all... long ago, every penny of it. His debts, and there were so many things we needed. Kitty, they're besieging the house again. Hugh, oh, it's so humiliating. He's hiding in the attic. Life has never been easy, Kitty, but this... This is the lowest ebb. I'll see what I can do, Lady Susan. I'll try. Soon, Kitty, please. It's so terribly important. Kitty, how nice you look. I can't stay, Sir Hugh. I just came here to give you this. Well, well, money. Yes. Sixty pounds. Yes. What a generous, thoughtful creature you are, Kitty. Tell me, where did you get the money this time? From Jonathan. He didn't object? He doesn't know it yet. I broke open his strong box. Oh, what talent! You may lack some of the social graces, Kitty, but you've got all the fundamentals. If I only knew a dozen like you, I could live like a king. I should think by this time you'd know you're lucky to have one like Kitty. Don't worry, dear Auntie. I know. I know. Jonathan's home. I, I've got to get right back. Goodbye, Lady Susan. Thank you, Kitty. Thank you, my dear, for both of us. Answer me, Kitty. Have I ever denied you anything? Have I? No, Jonathan, no. You asked me for money today, and I gave you five pounds. I needed more. So you steal 60 pounds from his strong box. Let me go. You're hurting me. No wife of mine is going to lie and cheat. Tell me what you did with it. Take your hands off me, you rotten swine. Take them off or I'll bash your mug into you. What's that you said? What other language is that? What else is there about you that I don't know? I said what else? <laughs> Speak up. Tell me the truth or I'll take it out of you. Where did you learn such language? Who are you? How will you answer me? Answer me! What are you doing to her? Mrs. Shelby, no, no! Get out of here! I'll no, beat it out of no. here! I'll beat it out of here! No. I'll... Nelly! It won't hurt you now more, Mrs. Shelby. Now more. Murderer! You've killed him! I saw you do it! He was taken. I saw you! He was hurt, No use trying to run away, Nelly. Go to your room while I call a constable. Mrs. Shelby! Maybe I better fetch a surgeon too. About done in herself, she oh, is. Mrs. Shelby. You're sure you feel well enough to discuss it, Mrs. Selby? You were my husband's lawyer. Go on. You were unconscious when it happened. Nelly killed him with a poker from the fireplace. Where where is Nelly? Dead too, Mrs. Selby. Hanged herself before the constable got here. Oh, a horrible experience for you men. But try not to worry about anything. Your husband left you well provided for. Conservatively, the estate is worth more than 40,000 pounds. I won't trouble you with the details now. Call on me whenever you're ready, Mrs. Selby. Thank you. I don't want to appear callous, Kitty. But it is a relief having your husband gone. What a strain it would be having to break into that box every time one of us needed money. I must say I was worried over what that housekeeper might do, Hugh. I think it was very clever of you to give her a pension. Oh, dear, Kitty, those dreadful morning clothes. They're ridiculous for one so attractive. Kitty, throw them out. Now that you're free, I see no reason why we can't go through with our original plan. I saw the Duke this morning, eager as ever to meet you. I don't want to marry the Duke. Well, you can't mean that. A magnificent match. You'll be the envy of every woman in London. I don't care. I just want to be married to someone I love. Why can't we discuss it some other time? We'll discuss it now. You learn to love the Duke, Kitty. He's the most lovable man. Believe me, it's the thing for you. For me, too. The Duke is the one man who can put me back in the foreign office. But you don't need to go back. You can have my money. All of it. Kitty, I was thrown out in disgrace. My career was blasted. There's a stain that must be removed. It means more than anything in the world to me. Just don't forget to address the Duke as your grace when he comes. I, uh, 
I took the liberty of inviting him to tea. You, you didn't. Oh, how tiresome. I know you won't let me down, Kitty. You're going to be disappointed if he doesn't ask me to marry him, aren't you? There's no fear of that. He's already looking upon you as his wife. If he's coming for tea, I, I'd better make myself ready. How fortunate you stopped by, Tom. Here, your invitation to Kitty's wedding. Where is Kitty? I should like to congratulate her. Where, Mr. Gainsborough? With her husband-to-be, of course. Richard, Duke of Malmonster. I rather think I should be congratulated. And why? For turning a little gutter baggage into a duchess. A neat trick. <laughs> the trick was in having me for an aunt. Kitty could never have passed as a lady without me to guide her. Uh, permit me to remind you both. If I hadn't painted Kitty's portrait, none of this would have happened. And you wouldn't be back in the foreign office, my dear Hugh. Perhaps we should all congratulate each other. Mr. Gainsborough, Lady Susan, to our very good health. Kitty, are you sure you're all right? I'm very well, Richard. Kitty, this has been the happiest year of my life. And to think, to think, that on the anniversary of our marriage, you have the most exciting news of all. Where's that doctor? Confound him! I told him to stay near you. Doctor! Yes, Your Grace. Look at her! Are you sure she's fit? Oh, she seems to be. Odds fire! How can you tell? Feel her pulse, man. Oh, 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 oh. you prospective fathers. It's much too soon to be worried. Her pulse is a trifle fast, but that means nothing. Just the same, Kitty. Don't dance anymore tonight. Your Grace, I think it might be wiser if you worried a little more about yourself. You drink far too much, sir. Uh, your heart. You know, I've warned you before. Glass of port never hurt anyone. <laughs> oh, where's the Earl of Cumberland? <laughs> Excuse me, Kitty. I must tell him our wonderful news. I've been trying to find you alone all evening. May I have this dance, Duchess? If you'd like, Sir Hugh. You've been with Miss Carlyle all evening. Are you interested in her? If the time ever arrives when I want to be interested, I couldn't do much better. You mean she's a lady? That's certainly in her favor. Kitty... Your husband's glaring at us. <laughs> he thinks I shouldn't dance. You see, I'm going to have a baby. What? Tell me that again. It's quite true. Thank you for the dance, Your Grace. It's not finished. It is as far as I'm concerned. Or we'll finish it next year, perhaps. Your husband is one man I don't care to antagonize. Of course you. Kitty, I wish you wouldn't dance. I've stopped, Richard. I'm sorry. There, there. <laughs> You're just a little girl after all. <laughs> Once you've given me my son, you can be as gay as you like. I'll take you to every ball in London. What if I give you a daughter? I won't consider such a thing. Won't have a daughter. Keep your mind on having a son. I've already put his name down for Eton. What name have you given him, Richard? Roy Douglas, after my father. He'll be the 10th Duke of Malmonster. 10th Duke of Malmonster? I'll have a son for you, Richard. Kitty, my darling Kitty. May I congratulate you, Your Grace? You're the father of a fine son. A son? A son? How, uh, how is she, my wife? Asleep, Your Grace. Did splendidly. Good, strong English stock. Ah. My lord, you're all flushed. Your pulse, it's racing. Have you been at that port again? Lord's fire, why shouldn't my pulse be fast? I'm a father. Lie down, please. Kindly, my servants want to hear the news. I'm going downstairs and tell them. Arthur, Derek, Pathwell, I have an heir. I have a son. Your grace. Oh, what happy news, sir. Thank you. Geoffrey, did you hear... And there. It's incredible, Kitty. All this in a year and a half. Twice married, twice widowed, and one of the richest women in the empire. 
By the way, you might give me Balgowan Hall. I could use a place in the country. You'll never miss just one castle. Of course, you. Now, what about you? What are your plans? That's up to you. Well, it's going to be awfully difficult to improve your position anymore. Of course, we could consider the prince. He's admired you greatly. Oh, stop it. Don't you think I'm human? Don't you ever think of me as someone with feelings like anyone else? Or is it that you just don't care? Don't care? Twice I've married men to help you. Why do you think I did that? Because you were grateful to me and aware of a good chance for yourself. I did it because I hoped one day you might notice me and see that I was in love with you. I was willing to do anything you... Kitty, I... Well, I... It just never occurred to me. Ours is a more uh, business arrangement. I know why it never occurred to you. Because I was just a little gutter snipe and you was a gentleman. Were a gentleman. Were a gentleman. So what I thought or felt didn't matter. You were too selfish to think of anyone but yourself. Now, look here. That's not quite fair. I've done very well for you, Kitty. I made you out of nothing. I brought you into a title and a fortune. I created you as you are today. And I created you, too. You'd still be in prison if I hadn't stolen for you. Yes, that's quite true. So the score's even, isn't it? Quite even. Then we're through. We're finished. Kitty, you're all upset. You're angry. We should be friends, the best of friends. I don't want to be friends with you. I don't want to ever see you again. Now go on and clear out of here. Careful, Kitty. You're slipping back to Houndsditch, to old Meg. You can't forget it, can you? You'll never forget it. Or maybe I'll forget it if I never see you again. Now go on. Clear out. Clear out! Kitty! Clear out! Goodbye, Kitty. We'll bring you Act Three of Kitty, starring Paulette Goddard and Patrick Knowles in a moment. You might say that our guest tonight was discovered by the Army. I mean Army public relations officers who ask her to appear in Army motion pictures. After that, it didn't take long for 20th Century Fox to find and sign blonde and blue-eyed Marilyn Monroe. I understand you passed a Technicolor screen test with honors, Marilyn. Well, I'm not superstitious, Mr. King... Keasley. But in this case, I think I was lucky. How do you mean, lucky? Well, the film they used was left over from the shooting of Be Betty Grable's new picture for 20th Century Fox, The Shocking Miss Pilgrim. I see. And did you meet Betty Grable herself? Oh, yes. And how we laughed about her wardrobe for the picture. Well, correct office clothes for 1874 were a little enveloping. <laughs> Especially the petticoats and pantalettes Betty had to wear in The Shocking Miss Pilgrim. They had yards and yards of ruffles and ribbon. Imagine doing all that washing. And no Lux Flakes to do it with in those days. Why, that's right, Mr. Kennedy. It's a good thing Betty didn't have to live her role. If she had to take care of all those undies herself, she wouldn't have had much time for romancing the way she does with Dick Hames in the picture. I thank my lucky stars I'm a career girl of the Lux era. Lux helps a lot, doesn't it? That's right, Mr. Kennedy. It's my standby. And that of thousands of other girls, Miss Monroe. You know, women have been telling us for years how lovely their lingerie stays with Lux Care. But, of course, they couldn't measure how much longer colors stay fresh. So we had an independent laboratory make actual washing tests with identical slips and nightgowns. Those washed the wrong way faded quickly. In many cases, the shoulder straps frayed and seams burst. But those that were washed the Lux way stayed lovely three times as long. Any girl would rather have pretty undies than faded ones. She can have more pretty ones, too, the Lux way. Instead of replacing drab, faded under things so often... She can buy extra ones without spending a cent more. Have three times as many. I leave it to you, ladies. Isn't Lux an easy way to have more pretty undies? Thank you for coming tonight, Miss Marilyn Monroe. Back now to your producer, William Keeley. Our curtain rises on Act Three, starring Paulette Goddard as Kitty and Patrick Knowles as Sir Hugh Marcy. Many months have gone by, but the breach between Kitty and you has not narrowed. Now, on a spring afternoon, you visits his old friend, Sir Thomas Gainsborough. Now, be honest, you. Did you have any particular reason for coming to see me? Oh, must I have one? Mm, usually, of course not. But uh, I'm expecting two old friends. Well, I'm accepted by all the better people these days. It happens I'm expecting Kitty and Brett. Kitty and Brett? Is that so startling? Surely you know Brett's back from India. Of course, I've seen him a dozen times. But how did he meet Kitty? Here, here. I might say quite a warm friendship has developed. 
<laughs> I feel quite like Cupid. I'm acquainted with the sensation, Tom. I hope you find it more pleasant. Well, now, see here. Brett's a fine fellow. Oh, the best. It's still amusing, Tom. Really amusing. The uh, humor of the situation escapes me. Well, you know Kitty as well as I do. Better, perhaps. The trouble with you is that you think of Kitty as what she was, not as what she is. Look at my new portrait of her. That isn't the dirty little urchin who stole my snuff box. That's a lady, the Duchess of Malmunster. Excuse me, Sir Thomas. Her Grace, the Duchess of Malmunster and the Earl of Carstairs. Oh, show them in. Tom, hello. Hello, Kitty. Kitty, well, I haven't seen you for some time. Hello, Hugh. Come to think of it, Brett, I haven't seen you for days either. Been meaning to drop in, Hugh, but I've been busy. So I hear. Well, Kitty, there's your new portrait. All finished. Tom. Oh, thank you. Perfect, Tom. Perfect. It's all there. Her charm, her grace. Thank you, Brett. Kitty, we should... I mean, you should have Tom do a portrait of young Roy Douglas. Oh, I doubt if he could sit still long enough. <laughs> How is the baby, Kitty? Bouncing? Quite well, thank you. Tom, don't be cross if we have to run off. But, my dear, you just got here. I promised Brett I'd spend the afternoon alone with him. He said he has a number of things to tell me. Really only one thing, Kitty. Darling, please, kissing me in company. <laughs> Goodbye, Tom. Wonderful painting. Thank you again. Goodbye, Hugh. Goodbye, Kitty. Good luck, Brett. Obliged, Hugh. Not very sociable, were they? Oh, people in love seldom are. Does it surprise you that someone of Brett's taste and refinement appreciates Kitty? I'm just beginning to appreciate Kitty myself. Oh, rather sudden, isn't it? Very sudden. As a matter of fact, within the last five minutes. That's better. Nothing that happens in five minutes can be very serious. You can die in less time. Tom, she's a lady. Let her alone, you. You had your chance with Kitty. Now let her be happy. She'll be happier with me. On what possible basis? Because she loves me. Oh, you don't know what you're talking Maybe about. Maybe not. We'll see, Tom. I'm very sorry, Sir Hugh, but Her Grace cannot see you now. She's in her dressing room. I told you it was important. I conveyed that to Her Grace. I'm conveying myself upstairs. I beg your pardon? Do you presume to stop me? I'm merely following orders, sir. Good. I'm ordering you to stand aside. I told my servant I could not see you. Nevertheless, you are seeing me. Dismiss your maid. You may go, Annie. Celia. Kitty... A strange thing happened to me this afternoon. I found out how I really felt about you. Was that before or after you'd eaten? No, I mean it. I've been selfish and cruel, but I, I never realized I'd been stupid as well. Kitty, please. You're not trying to tell me you're in love with me. I am. Then why don't you say it? All right. I say it. <sighs> that was very sweetly put. Oh, I know your pride's been hurt, but forgive me, Kitty. We can start out fresh. I already have. That day I told you I was through with you. And I've never been more happy. I suppose that means Brett. Yes. You only turned to him because we quarreled. Originally, yes. Since then, I've discovered he's the most wonderful person I've ever known. Oh, what's so wonderful about him? His stories of India? Everything. Is he any better looking than I? Oh, you're both good looking, but uh, he's not dissipated. We both have titles, too. We all three have titles. Mine's the best of all. Kitty, you're baiting me. You couldn't have changed this suddenly. Well, you did. You just said so. I, I've cared for you all along. I, I simply didn't know it. Then say goodbye on that note. Brett will be calling for me directly. Oh, let's stop this nonsense. Would you rather have me get down and crawl? Yes, I would. Well, I won't do it. Oh, the same old Hugh. And I won't accept your being in love with Brett. Perhaps you will when I marry him. I beg your pardon, Your Grace. The maid thought you might be needing me and the footman. Yes. You may show Sir Hugh to the door. Oh, uh, Hugh, just one more thing. Have you noticed? This is the first time we've had a long talk, and you haven't had to correct me. Yes. It's always painful when the pupil thinks she's learned enough to dismiss the teacher. Are you all right, Your Grace? All right. Why, in my whole life, I have never felt better. <laughs> It's an invitation, Hugh. A messenger just left it. Open it up, Aunt Susan. Kitty, Duchess of Malmonster, announces her betrothal to Brett, Earl of Carstairs, and requests the pleasure of the company of Sir Hugh Marcy and Lady Susan Dowett at a reception Tuesday evening, July 25th. Of course we'll go, Hugh. Of course, Aunt Susan. Of course. Of course. 
Well, Hugh, aren't you going to congratulate us? Everyone else has. All in good time, Brett. Which reminds me, Kitty, there's an old friend of yours here. She wants to be remembered to you. She wasn't dressed, so I asked her to wait in the music room. She'll be brokenhearted if she doesn't get a chance to wish you luck. Oh, you too, Brett. Kitty? Of course, darling. Come along. But who could it be? I haven't the least idea. Well, there she is, Kitty. Surely you remember old Meg from Houndsditch? Well, if it ain't my little Kitty. My little Kitty. Kitty all decked up like a lady. <laughs> you, why do you do this to me? Because I love you. Knowing what you were, I still love you. But will he love you when he knows the same thing? Kitty, will you please tell me what this is all about? Of course, Brett. Meg, tell this gentleman everything you know about me. Here, here. What's your game? Where I came from, what I was when I lived with you. Oh, if that's the way you want it. I got her from a foundling home. Paid good money for her, I did. I got a big heart, I have. Treated her like me own child. Never did a stroke of work till she was eight. I kept her by me and learned her everything I knew. That's right, Brett. Every trick of theft and all the life that went with it. Then she hops and disappears. Just as she could have started a paying me back, she did. Now, that's enough, Meg. Oh, you ain't cross with old Meg, are you, dearie? You told me to tell him. No, I'm not cross with you. If you wait here, one of the servants will bring a purse for you. Goodbye, your highness. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> I'm sorry you had to find out this way, Brett. I want you to know that you're free. Free? You'd still marry me? Oh, Kitty, darling, this doesn't change anything. You're the same person I fell in love with. Well, Kitty, that's not the answer I expected to give you, but it's most convincing. I hate to admit it, Brett, you're worthy of Kitty and I'm not. May I offer you the congratulations I withheld before? I want you to be happy, Kitty. Brett. Oh, Brett. Darling. Brett, I can't marry you. I thought I hated him, but tonight when he said he loved me, I, I knew there could never be anyone else. Kitty, I, I'm afraid I don't understand. No, Brett, you never could. You understands me. We're two of a kind. Well, it was nice while it lasted, Kitty. Be happy. Thank you, Brett. I, I'm so sorry. Nickel? Nickel? Your no, Grace, is there anything wrong? Sir Hugh, have you seen him? Where did he go? I believe he left, Your Grace, by way of the garden. Thank you. Just down the path, Kitty. You! Kitty! Kitty! Now then, uh, what were you saying, Your Royal Highness? As Prince of Wales, nothing of much import. But as a man, Gainsborough, I just made a remarkable observation. Women, sir, are extraordinary creatures. Yes, Your Highness. Now, why should our charming Kitty throw herself away on such a bounder? Look at them. Kissing. I'm sure I don't know, sir. He's so far beneath her. Our stars will return to a curtain call in just a moment. Meanwhile, Sally, how keen are your ears? Just how do you mean, Mr. Kennedy? I mean, can you tell by a woman's speech where she comes from? <laughs> Try me. All right. Here are three ladies. I'll introduce them in a minute. Each is going to read a paragraph while you guess where her home is. This is Mrs. A. Will you read this, Mrs. A? The dishes were very greasy, but I rinsed them first in hot water and then washed them in lox flakes. Afterwards, my hands were still soft and white and smooth. Mm, south, of course. Mississippi? How about that? My home's in Natchez. Good guess, Sally. Uh, now here's Mrs. B. Mrs. B, will you read this sentence? Mary said she'd never marry if she had to wash dishes. But she tried Lux Flakes, and now she says it's as easy as rolling off a log. Lux helps her hands stay soft and smooth. All right, Sally. The Middle West. Kansas? That's absolutely right. And now our third guest, Mrs. C. Will you read this sentence, please? I wouldn't be without Lux Flakes. I use Lux for dishes, of course, and for every soap and water job about the house. Washing woodwork, linoleum, porcelain, tiles. 
It's so easy on the hands. That's somewhere in New England. Uh, let's see, Boston? Actually, it's Medford. That's about seven miles from Boston. Good for you, Sally, and thank you, ladies. No matter how they say it, women who care about their hands use Lux Flakes for dishes. It's so mild and gentle. Hundreds of women made scientific tests of five soaps widely used for dishwashing. In case after case, they proved Lux kinder to hands. Lux Flakes actually go further, too. Ounce for ounce, you can wash up to twice as many dishes with Lux Flakes as with any of ten other leading soaps tested. It's thrifty. Here's your producer, Mr. William Keeley. After meeting them so enjoyably in Kitty, I'm sure you'd like to meet our stars in person as we bring them back to the footlights for a curtain call. Paulette Goddard and Patrick Knowles. <laughs> Paulette, I understand you're packing for England almost as soon as you leave our theater. That's right, Bill. I'm sailing next week on the Queen Elizabeth. Couldn't find an able... Uh, that's great. You couldn't find room for an able-bodied stowaway, could you? <laughs> I can imagine, Pat, you'd like to see your native England again. Pat, I'm sure your family and fans would miss you. Speaking of families, I understand, Paulette, that you're a matrimonial expert in your latest Paramount picture with Fred McMurray, Suddenly that's, at Spring. That's right, Bill. What sort of advice do you give, Paulette? For instance, if I should have a quarrel with my wife, what would you suggest? Just kiss and make up, silly. Yes, it's rather nice to see people make up. Kissing isn't bad either. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Pat, yours is one of many solid Hollywood romances. What's your formula? Oh, my wife goes her way and I go with her. <laughs> <laughs> well, you should be able to give advice on matrimony, Bill. You've been happily married to one of our favorite stars for years. You used to direct Genevieve Tobin in pictures, didn't you, Bill? Yes, and in that direction lay romance. Coming back to your official capacities, what are you presenting here on Lux? Next Monday evening, Bill. Next week, we bring our audience an evening of chills, thrills, and action when we present 20th Century Fox's exciting drama, Somewhere in the Night. And our stars will be John Hodiak and Lynn Barry. John was in the screenplay, wasn't he? Yes, and he duplicates that role next Monday on our stage in the unusual story of a man whose loss of memory forces him to track down his identity in the face of baffling and incriminating circumstances. That sounds like an exciting evening for your audience, Bill. Congratulations and good night. Good, good night, night and bon voyage, Paulette. Thank you. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents... John Hodiak and Lynn Barry in Somewhere in the Night. This is William Keeley saying good night to you from Hollywood. The war is over, but the Red Cross carries on in its services to the armed forces, to veterans, to victims of disaster, and to those in need in your community. More than a million veterans and their families were assisted by the Red Cross last year and many more will need assistance during 1947. Help repay the debt we owe our veterans by giving generously to your Red Cross. Patrick Knowles appeared through the courtesy of Paramount Studios, producers of the Technicolor picture, California, starring Ray Milland and Barbara Stanwyck. Heard in our cast tonight were Alan Reed as Gainsborough, Louise Lorimer as Lady Susan, Norman Field as the Duke of Malminster, and Raymond Lawrence, Eric Snowden, Gloria Gordon... George Neese, Ann Tobin, Herbert Rawlinson, and Charles Seal. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. This program is broadcast to our men and women overseas through cooperation with the Armed Forces Radio Service. And this is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy, reminding you to tune in again next Monday night to hear Somewhere in the Night with John Hodiak and Lynn Barry. Surprise! When you bake and fry. Surprise! For your cake and pie. Surprise! Rely on Spry. For lighter, better-tasting cakes, try Spry, the pure, bland, all-vegetable shortening with the magic cake-making secret. Hear them say, boy, what a cook. Rely on Spry. S-P-R-Y. Rely on Spry. S-P-R-Y. Be sure to listen in next Monday night to the Lux Radio Theater presentation of Somewhere in the Night with John Hodiak and Lynn Berry. And why not tune in later tonight to hear the Joan Davis Show. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.